Hi everyone, welcome to this session. We're going to be starting in a couple of minutes, so it'd be great if you could introduce yourselves in the chat box, tell me what you're teaching, where you're based, and also we have a poll up uh, just to find out which board you are going to be with or thinking about being with. It would be really handy if you could fill that, please. Um, that's great, thank you. And in the chat box, if you could just tell me where you're based, please. So if you've just joined, welcome. My name is Juliet Park. We're going to start in a couple of minutes. We have a chat box open for you to fill uh, in where you're based, what language you teach, say a good uh, hello, whereabouts are you? And then if you could fill the poll in, please, this would be really helpful. Thank you. And while we're waiting, I'm Juliet Park. I'm um, from West Yorkshire. I'm actually in the Lake District at the moment. Uh, and we're up here to do a bit of hiking with the fantastic weather, which hopefully you're experiencing when, wherever you are as well. Got people from all over, that's great. Thank you for that. I'm going to do to start in about one minute's time. Be frightened to fill in the chat box, please. Let us know where you are. If you've just joined, please fill in uh, the poll. That just gives me an idea of where people are currently in their thinking for future uh, specification. And also uh, tell me where you're based in this uh, area of the world. I am up in Cumbria at the moment, but I'm from uh, West Yorkshire. Okay, so we're going to get going and I uh, hope you find this interesting. So just a quick explanation of me and who I am and what I'm hoping to do in this session today. So my name is Juliet Park. I'm a Director of Languages in West Yorkshire. I look after uh, schools in the area, mostly secondary. We do have some primary as well. Uh, I also work for AQA and I was involved or have been over the last couple of years in the teach panel. And we've also done some trialing of the specification and the new exam style uh, in our school, testing it on our uh, year 11s uh, just over a year ago to give feedback. So um, I'm also involved uh, at the moment in the um, preparing to teach the AQA sessions that have been uh, around in the last couple of months and we have some new events coming out in March. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you'll be able to see it, just bear with me, and then we will get going. Just bear with me a second while I open everything up, make sure I've got everything in front of me. Okay, so although I work for AQA and we are going down the AQA route, uh, a number of things I'm going to be talking about today is appropriate, whatever awarding body you're with. And a lot of the specification is based on the DFE recommendations of qual requirements. So although there are differences between the schemes of work, there are also some similarities. So some of the activities, the thought process we are going through is equivalent to everyone. Not uh, It doesn't really matter, uh, you know, with those things about uh, which awarding body you're going to be going with. So uh, before we start, a little jargon buster activity. Um, I'd like you to just have a look at those phrases which appear in the specification. So in the AQA, Specification, we have three phrases there that have conf uh, caused confusion uh, with some of my colleagues. Can you tell me in the chat box what you think those phrases mean? If you don't know, just tell me you don't know. So what, what do we think those phrases mean? Give you 20 seconds to have a think about it. OK, so, yeah, it's quite confusing. They are very kind of uh, 
linguistically based terms and it's a, it's good to know what these words mean because when you go on on in the specification on them uh, at least you'll understand so these phrases come up in the grammar section they come up in the verb section and i'm going to reveal what each of them mean because uh, they do have a bearing on what we're going to be teaching so inflectional morphology means changes to existing word formats that in our terms is conjugation so it's verb conjugation by the, the way these are aqa phrases they have come obviously from a uh, department of education from the research that was done on the recommendations now de derivational morphology okay is where you create a new word from a base word and this is particularly relevant in the reading paper Okay, so the government are wanting children to be able to work out the meaning of a new word based on a base word, such as rapid, rapidement. So where you've got, for example, um, an adjective and you're turning it into an adverb. Periphrastic future expression, what a mouthful. We know it as the near future. So all it is, is where you're taking two words uh, as opposed to inflecting a word. So instead of j'irai, I will go, you're changing je vais to je vais jouer. So it's using two words as opposed to one. So those are quite useful to know, especially when you start to look into the uh, specification. Now, most people I speak to, because I work as a consultant nationally, are saying, we don't have to make a lot of change. We're quite happy where we are and what we're doing at the moment. And maybe that's the case. However, hopefully today, There'll be some aspects that maybe you haven't thought of that maybe would be useful to consider, especially with what you're doing with your key stage three curriculum. So I want to very quickly cover a quick look at themes. I'm going to focus on AQA. They are slightly different to edit cell, not massively, but slightly. Think about the topics, the vocab, the grammar, phonics, the skills focus, what we should be maybe tweaking or how to tweak assessments and what criteria we may wish to use so that it is in student friendly speak. So these are the AQA okay, themes. Uh, and the main difference is um, around one aspect with Edexcel, but we'll just have a look quickly. Celebrity culture is the key difference for us if you are going with AQA. So that's something I think will really bring to life uh, and hopefully appeal to young children uh, with regard to celebrity culture, so people who are influencers. We use things like Lea Seydoux, Xavier Bardem from the James Bond film. So we've looked at foreign actors, etc., singers. Um, which bit has gone out? The main thing to consider is charity and voluntary works. So social issues, some of that is still there, but charity and voluntary work is no more, so that needs to be taken out of our curriculum. So people and lifestyles, let's look at the first theme in a little bit more depth. The main change there is AQA being very, very focused on EDI, equality, diversity, inclusion. And if you look in the grammar, or rather, sorry, the vocab list, you'll notice that there are words in their vocab to do with gender and orientation more than there was before. So please bear that in mind. In terms of popular culture, well, the main focus here I would say there's a slight tweak on free time focusing on sporting events. So, for example, in the vocab list, you will see Le Tour de France. So that is really a, a good idea to be covering those kind of events. Customs festival celebrations is a big part of AQA. I'm not sure if it features as much in Edexcel. Don't quote me on that. Obviously, I'm focused on AQA. But um, I think the festivals, etc. there's lots of uh, vocab to go at in there relating to specific festivals. So this is, again, something we can really bring uh, alive in our teaching and then celebrity culture. So that, I think, is something that we can keep editing, updating and make it relevant and look at local trends um, in the target language and obviously countries that we're dealing with. Communication in the world around us is theme three. No big changes there. So I don't think there's anything really to highlight in that theme. Now, it's really worth looking carefully at the vocabulary list because we know there's 1,200 for foundation tier, 1,700 for higher. It's very important to look at the multi-word phrases. They appear as a separate section in the specification. 
and also be mindful of the cultural items such as the ones you can see on screen. Now you may be aware that uh, AQA have a Excel spreadsheet and you can use this to search and maybe compare and contrast some of the vocabulary we were teaching. What we've done is try to strip out things that we really don't need and really make sure we're covering what we do need. So when you use this spreadsheet, it's worth looking at the theme, the topic that you may be teaching, but also consider the cultural vocabulary, the general vocabulary and the multi-word phrases. Now, the way it works is you can search a long list or you can break it down into those components such as adjective, adverb, cultural item, etc. So it's, I think it's important to really note because particularly, um, well, with this specification, every word on there needs to be learnt to be able to produce it as well as understand it. So it's really important that they can use it in a receptive as well as a productive way. Really important difference there. So what we've tended to do sometimes is to take texts and we've looked at what is different, what is new in the spec, what can we get rid of? So you can see those five, six words there are no longer in the spec. So what we've done is made some quick tweaks, particularly with things like texts. Um, I mentioned uh, cultural items. So I mentioned the Tour de France. So La Manche, the English channel, features on the vocabulary list. So something such as using the Un Jour Un Actu website, we've used that to do some cultural teaching around the English channel. A lot of the children I teach don't travel abroad. Many of them uh, may go to Pakistan, for instance, uh, every couple of years to visit family, but many of them don't go on holiday. So when I talk to them about a tunnel, which is obviously a cognate, so we do still use quite a few cognates that aren't in the spec. Um, it's really good cultural understanding for them and to bring alive some of these vocabulary, uh, the vocabulary that they maybe are not aware of culturally. So bringing more cultural aspects into your teaching based on the vocab uh, is, I think, really useful. This is another one. So King's Day, 6th of January, is something that features on the list. Uh, the only words that are not uh, from the spec are the word Jesus and pastel, but we're only talking two words there. So that actually was modified from something that previously existed. So we're tweaking uh, the vocabulary covered in our text. In terms of the grammar, I think it is very uh, clear that we need to look at the specification in depth. I don't think teachers have really analysed the grammar section of the specifications, perhaps in enough detail, and we're going to have a look at some examples, but I think we really do need to give those grammar aspects clear pedagogical intention in our teaching and make sure that students can understand and produce that knowledge and look at things like irregular verb parts. So in the vocabulary list, it'll irregular verbs such as lu, bu, etc., that don't follow a common pattern feature as separate words in the list. Uh, and really make sure we cover the verbs and tense as well, and maybe only cover what children are actually going to be assessed on. Now, don't look at this as a finished item because I've been working on this this week. There are three or four pages in the specification describing what is covered and what isn't. So for example, reflexive verbs for foundation level, children only need to learn the first, second and third person singular, not the full conjugation. And so we then need to question, well, do we need to cover the new VU, et cetera? Yes, for higher tier, but not for foundation. We also have what we call anchor verbs. Again, these were set by the recommendations from the DFE. So words like boire, connaître, courir, écrire, they form the kind of pattern. And what I've done is then analyze the specification to look at which other verbs follow those patterns so that we can really make sure we are teaching them and that children can uh, understand, but also manipulate them. So really important to understand what to cover at foundation and what to cover at higher, because they will not be tested on things that aren't going to be covered. Doesn't mean to say you can't teach them, but it's questionable as to whether we really want to burden them with that information if they're not going to need it receptively. Ask yourself, do we need them to be able to produce it? Okay, that's the French higher tier. 
I don't want to dwell too much on these. They are in draft format. And then foundation, again, I've really looked at what do they need, which pronouns, et cetera. Um, it may be worth noticing, for example, with Spanish hiatia, that the subjunctive needs to be covered in the first person for certain verbs. Okay, so please have a look. If you're using the AQA spec or whichever spec you're using, please have a look at what needs to be covered. Okay, so in terms of phonics, um, you may have seen in the specification that the sound symbol correspondence, SSC, which we sometimes use in place of the word phonics, uh, are listed. And these are what would be tested, for example, in the reading aloud section of the speaking. Okay, so you can see there um, that we've got a number of key sounds. And then what's nice is two examples are given. So you're clear in your own mind what that sound sounds like and what you maybe need to be focused on, on in lessons. So those are, those are the French ones, those are the German ones. Again, they're listed in an appendix at the back of the specification. And I like the fact that we do have examples. And then there are the Spanish ones. OK, so that gives you a flavour for what is included in terms of phonics. We... Uh, can expect that the children will be tested on those sounds, okay? So it's important to be thinking about how you're going to build these in and um, how you're going to teach them, how you're going to test them, how you're going to assess them. Uh, and we'll have a look at some ideas later. So that's the phonics section. Okay, so thinking about replanning our scheme of work, the way we're going about it, uh, may give you food for thought. It might be in more depth than what you're, than what you're doing in your schools, or um, it might be that um, you're quite happy with your scheme and you're not doing many changes. But the more we've looked into it, the more we think some more detailed planning needs to take place. So I'm going to go through some examples of our thought process and how we, we are working, let's say, more collaboratively across our trust. So I'm just going to take, for example, our year nine um, module, which happens to be on school. So we've looked at the specification. We've looked at what children might be tested on um, and the kind of, if you like, subtopics within the topic of school. So we know we want our children to be able to talk about their favourite subjects, least favourite subjects, that they may want to talk about homework, school rules, etc. There's nothing unusual there. It's very much like we were covering before. So what we first of all done is to create, you could call it a knowledge organizer, a content mat. And we've really tried to break it down into either grammatical categories or sort of, if you like, subtopics. Now, what's interesting is that when you go down the specification, not every word is in there that you would expect to see because the um, awarding bodies are limited in how much they can cover. So this is where you need to make a, perhaps um, a decision on what extra words you wish to teach. We're trying to not add too many. What we've done is really analyse and thought, what do children need that isn't there that is probably relevant? So, for example, this knowledge organiser, or content matters, we call them, includes most things that are in the spec, but I'll give you an example of here. OK, so the word uniform and trousers is in the specification, but those that I've starred are not. And it might be that children do uh, want to use that vocabulary when describing their school uniform or even their favourite clothing. So this is where we've added some extra words, but we've been careful not to add too many. So it's worth doing a little bit of analysis to make sure you're covering what is needed, but also what extra can you get away with adding without overloading them uh, with too much extra vocabulary, which of course is not going to be tested in the exam papers. What we've then done is to create some medium term plans. Now, I wouldn't say we're teaching any differently in the, um, if you like, topics. Obviously, we've stripped out things like volunteering, which we didn't cover in great depth anyway uh, at Key Stage 3, but we certainly won't be covering it now. So we're sticking very much with the same topics, even the same topic order and sequence. And of course, 
the grammar doesn't change, but we've been a little bit more, if you like, focused on what we do need to cover uh, and assess and check um, throughout each topic area. So we've planned the lesson focus over a series of weeks. We then look at a phoneme each week, each lesson. What are we going to cover? We look at the key vocabulary and phrases. Now you can see there that there are three different colors appearing. So if it's in black, it's because it hasn't been seen before. If it's in orange, it's, um, it's been seen once in a previous module. And if it's in red, we know that we've taught it um, more than once. And it just helps us uh, structure how we are ensuring that that vocabulary that is absolutely essential is being covered. Then we've got the grammar focus, and then we have got out of school learning, independent learning. So if you like, the sound spelling correspondence, the vocabulary and the grammar, as we know, are the three pillars of language learning. So we always really look at those in depth for every lesson. So not hugely different from what we were doing, but perhaps a little bit more focused on those three elements. Um, so I mentioned we are sticking to the same topic order. We have a similar sequencing of grammar, uh, same type of le lesson activities. We do a lot of receptive processing and then we move to production, but we do a lot of drilling, a lot of modeling. We're not changing the style of how we teach. It's more that the focus of every lesson is around those three pillars. It was before, but even more so. Sometimes we've changed the, as I say, the actual sequence in a lesson, not the sequence of the receptive to the productive, but the particular focus points, the key components. And because we want all our teachers to really understand the three pillars, to really understand how we are, if you like, tweaking the design of some of our lessons, we're getting more of our staff now involved in actual, actual uh, resource production and development. Now this, I'm just going to show you this because um, it's not hugely relevant, but it might be uh, helpful to some of you, is that because we're sharing resources across the trust, we want it to be highly teacher friendly as well as student friendly. So if we, if you like, we have some non-negotiables about how we want our uh, teachers to be creating so it's usable, not just across departments, but across different schools in the trust. OK, so just a few ideas there. Now, one thing we always do is a do now. Obviously, these can be drafted in different formats that can be described in different ways. But what we're trying to do is every lesson to focus on the three pillars, the phonics, the vocabulary, the grammar. So you can see this is just one example. Doesn't necessarily have to be this layout, but we have a rule that um, we want our learners to really remember that sound spelling is crucial, it's very essential, that we want to recap vocabulary learnt in the previous uh, lesson, and we want them to think about a different type of grammar element. So section three could be all sorts of things. It could be a verb gap fill. It could be, for example, as you can see, see here, possessives. It could be what word would come next. So the grammar section, uh, we do quite a few different types of uh, little grammar chunks there. And then we put a translation in. And we have a rule that that we only give students about five minutes to do this maximum. And then we have a couple of minutes to go through it. But what that does is revisit previous things that have been learned and to just quickly go through and recap. So that's how we focus on um, a starter activity. The bits at the bottom are just for the quick learners if they want to go and do anything different. When we do the phonics section, we won't always cover words that they have seen before. Some of them are, but some of them would be new. So for example, we've just done transport with year eight. They won't have seen the word bois, wood yet, but what we want them to do is to be able to see that if they come across an unwer unknown word, they can manage to say it and think in, out loud in their heads how it would sound. So they just highlight and then we pick students to actually read them out, even those that are unknown words. Now, we don't just go for any random unknown words. We make sure they're words that they're going to be covering at some future point that have come from this specification. 
The three pillars, um, we break down obviously phonics, vocab, grammar. We make sure learners understand what the focus points will be in a particular lesson. Um, these are the key components. Across our trust now, we call them the golden threads, okay? In other words, the key components, the key knowledge. So we always make sure students are well aware of what's going to be the focus point of every lesson. So if we just have a look at phonics, um, I showed you earlier the specification and the screenshots of French, German, Spanish. Now, it's really important, obviously, in year seven, that these are really handled well, that we really push the phonemes, because what we want to do is avoid them getting into bad pronunciation habits. Now, not every phoneme um, is as important as each other, because some of them cause more issues than others. So the ones on the screen, for example, are the ones that we really do need learners to understand. So these are the ones that we are particularly going to push and that will feature more regularly starting in year seven. This is the same with the Spanish. Again, we've got some key phonemes that learners really do need to know. So obviously we teach French and Spanish across our trust. We don't teach German, but I'm sure as Germanists, you'll know which ones are the key ones and need to be prioritized above other ones. So uh, just a quick idea of how we might approach phonics teaching. Uh, sometimes it's explicit. Sometimes we just would do a phonics discussion based on if we hear uh, a bad pronunciation and think it's worth trialing. So we do do some explicit, but not necessarily every single lesson. But for example, you can see here that most of those words have got the O-N sound. And again, we are not just covering words that they have used or are using in this particular module. So we'll bring others in and obviously we will read them out and then we will get the students to pronounce and then we'll pick learners in the class to say them again. So every week, I would say, there is a particular phoneme that we're focusing on. This one would be where, for example, with our year eights, they've been learning about uh, silent uh, letters, but also what we're trying to do is to get them to think about the silent ending T, but the A, N sound. So sometimes we may have phonemes that are very similar and they've got to choose which one it is. Sometimes it might be two very different ones. It depends on what we've been covering. So those would be particular task types. And then again, you've got another, um, is it the E sound? Is it the E accent? Which is something you know that, that learners really do struggle with. So je regarde, je regarde. Um, and, or could it be j'aime regarder? Could it be E-R? Could it be E accent? So sometimes it's good to build in grammar practice as well as the sound spelling link. So you can combine activities to hit uh, two birds with one stone, i.e phoneme and grammar practice. So that's just a, a couple of quick ideas. Now, vocabulary we know is very prescriptive now. We know students need to be able to use the vocabulary and recognize it in the exams. So what we often do is we do some vocabulary drills, but we get children to learn in pairs and we often get them to practice common detail, how do you say? And then instead of just saying the vocabulary itself, we often get them to use an opinion phrase in front, such as je pense que c'est, à mon avis c'est, je crois que c'est, because those are all obviously really good opinion phrases that they need to recognise and potentially be able to use in the writing and the speaking. So we often get paired activities such as this. We still use sentence builders. Uh, we use them a lot. Uh, we do a lot of mini whiteboard work. So this is not anything different to what we did before, often delayed dictation, et cetera, et cetera. So we do do a lot of work around sentence builders to really help them extend uh, the language that they're using. Uh, adaptation to text is another nice one. So when they've been doing quite a bit of work uh, around a topic and they're learning to go to paragraph text level, we then get them to do adaptation activities, but they have the content maps in front of them. We always print them off on yellow. We used to stick them in. Now we keep them as a kind of floating sheet so they can pull them out of the books and they can refer to them if they need them. So this is sort of building up to independent writing by changing the text, but again, 
we've been very, very careful to add words that are on the specification and just not random variations. So again, really focusing on the vocab lists. So in terms of grammar, I mentioned earlier, we're really being careful on how we scaffold grammar. We're doing regular checks. We're, we're using a lot of questioning. I do quite a bit of work with Dylan William on formative assessment and the SSAT. And what I'm trying to really get my staff to do is to understand how to use deeper questioning uh, to really get into the nitty gritty. I, I often see when I'm doing learning walks or I'm working with schools, because on Friday I go around nationally supporting schools, that questioning isn't perhaps used as effectively as it could be. We often um, put something up on the board where we want students to notice as opposed to trying to get bogged down with very explicit um, grammar points. So we know obviously young children struggle with explicit grammar um, explanations and we try to avoid that where we can. We still use a lot of modeling and noticing and pattern spotting. I think it's also important, particularly um, now that the foundation writing has a grammar gap fill in it, which we'll have a quick look at in a minute, is that uh, error correction is a really good thing to focus on. So just a couple of ideas here. Um, so it could be, and you remember my do now task with the third section on grammar. So it could be a class activity or a quick do now to just remind them of the key things where students go wrong, such as the wrong auxiliary, the wrong verb ending, particularly with things like uh, fui and fue in Spanish, so um, confusing for some students, even adjectival endings. So little things like that, if they're doing regularly at the beginning of every lesson, it's just constantly reminding them about where they may make errors, or it just, just could simply be a gap fill. So really focusing on common misconceptions, focusing on verb endings, adjectival endings, hopefully by the time they get to year 10, they're going to be reducing the number of errors they make. Um, I do this at the end of every piece of writing, particularly with GCSE, I'm sure many of you do, where trying to go through every single grammar uh, point with every single learner that they got wrong, uh, can be quite time consuming. We are very big on live marking in our school. And that means that when we're circulating, and I see a lot of teachers not doing it effectively enough, enough because I think often teachers circulate to try and make sure kids are on task and doing what they should be doing. But the problem is there, there's a lot of wasted time where if you were going around with your red or green pen, you could be live marking and having quick discussions with children. So when you look through our books, there's a lot of correction coding, a lot of highlighting with highlighters and children are acting on that feedback in the lesson. It really does cut down the level of marking we're doing. So after a piece of, say, GCSE uh, writing, we pull up what we feel are the most common errors and we get all the learners to make the changes. We discuss the problem, we show the answers and then they go away and redraft and improve such as a mock exam, mock writing. So collaborative error analysis, I think is really good because more often than not, students do tend to make the same errors. Um, just recently with our year sevens, we've moved from the I like to he, she likes. And of course that's quite complex to explain it. So we just may, for example, put this text up and say, can you make sense of it? You may not understand every word. So this is where we don't get get bogged down with complex grammar explanations. We will just drill the pattern so they really do absorb it. Um, and we just do lots of, I speak French, uh, Spanish, you say in English, I say in Spanish, you say in uh, Spanish, etc. And then we might do something like this where they have to listen to which one I'm saying. Then we would show the answer and then we would get the children to work out what they meant in English. So you can see there, we've not explained that it is le gusta. We just drilled over and over again. And it's I think it's a really effective way of tackling a difficult grammar program uh, problem or issue. Uh, and then again, we will use um, sentence builders, mini whiteboards. We do delayed dictation. Sometimes we'll say in Spanish, French, German, etc. Then we would say in English to really drill over and over again to really 
get them to memorize the pattern rather than get them too bogged down. And then we will get them to work in pairs. One of them says it in English, one of them say it in Spanish, one of them says it in English. So we're just doing lots and lots of drilling and modeling before the learners actually go to produce it and work on their own. Um, you've probably heard of hinge questions. This is um, a really good thing to check whether a key component has been really understood in the lesson. So it's often done in a multi-choice style. If you go to diagnosticquestioning.com, there are some preset hinge questions under different topics. And I think that would be really handy for people uh, to use uh, if you're short on time and want to know how to draft hinge questions. Sometimes hinge questions aren't designed as well as they could be, but they're there to test a key problem. So when you're designing the answers, you need to think about where might they not understand, for example, a phrase or a grammar point. And, and this helps you to really work out what learners are not understanding. So this is where you've got a really key component and you need to make sure the vast majority of your learners have, have nailed it before you move on. But this then can also be used as doing a bit of extra practice for those that don't quite get the point. Now I want to touch on assessments now. I want to sort of think in the last 10 minutes about what the key changes are to the GCSE and how this might change the way that we assess our key stage three learners. So can you just have a look there? These are the listening assessments. Uh, I'm looking again at the AQA spec here, so do check if you're with Edexcel, what is different? So what we're doing now is just looking at the key differences in the assessments that are coming up. Can you see what is no longer there? Something is missing and we don't need to put this in anymore. Can you see what it is? Let's read down the question types. It's one that really confuses the heck out of children, so they've got rid of it. Uh, yes, I will share my PowerPoint if you email me, not a problem. <laughs> I'll show you my email at the end. Okay, so I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. I'll show you what it is. There is now no true, false, not mentioned. That's gone because it was confusing children. So when you're creating your own listening assessments, don't use that one anymore. We don't need it. <laughs> Dictation, uh, the students will have to read out, uh, sorry, they'll hear four sentences. There will be two unknown words and they will get three plays of it. So when you are organising a dictation, those are things to bear in mind and you need to include a couple of unknown words outside the spec. But what it's doing is testing that sound spelling correspondence. This is an example of a Spanish one. You can see the word huevos and generosa are not in the spec. OK, but by using their knowledge of sound and spelling, hopefully they will be able to write it accurately. And you can see how it's marked. It's divided into sections and they're given an overall mark. Now I've created this as a student friendly version of marking, but this is my way of breaking down the AQA um, criteria for this section, because I think it will be easier for us to use, but also we can give this then to students. In terms of the reading assessments, remember on the AQA spec, there's a lot of cultural vocabulary in the cultural section, and other sections such as customs and festivals. So think about cultural capital, like I showed you with the English Channel, uh, King's Day, et cetera. Uh, what they want to do is go beyond Europe. It won't be Europe centric. But another thing I want to just have a quick look at is inference tasks. This applies to all awarding bodies, okay? Now an inference task, sorry, I'm just gonna come back to that one in a second. An inference task, I'll just let you have 10 seconds to read that. Okay, so this is where they have to work something out. It's a bit like a mystery word. It's a bit like a detective activity. And these are the three examples I'm showing you in all three languages. Let you have a quick look. So the word in bold is the word that they may not recognize. It's not on the specification. What they have to do is look at 
the sentences to try and gauge what this is about. So it's inference, okay? So if we just highlight the key words there, by understanding the word dormir, rêve, musique, shula, fena, ma, we should be able to get the right answer. So a couple of activities you could do is put a noun and a verb together and then get the children to think about what could those words that are in the um, speech marks, what could they mean? These are obviously not on the spec, but it's a great way to bring something cultural in. Uh, and that could be in the do now task. And then if you wanted to go into a bit more depth, you could actually create the exam style sentences. And it's what it's doing. It's training to them to use what they know to be able to tackle the question. OK, very quickly, uh, when you're designing any writing assessments, the photo is now five sentences, not four. The 40 words has gone up to 50 words, but the bullets are all in English. Five bullets for the 40 word. There are five sentences and a grammar gap fill, remember, for foundation. And there are three English bullets for the 90 words. They'll always be in the same chronicle or, uh, chronological order in terms of the tense, the time frame. Uh, and then on the 90 words, as I've mentioned, three bullets. So you will be able to go through this uh, webinar, watch it in more depth afterwards if you want to study this. But a couple of ideas. So that example shows you how learners do need to manipulate those verb patterns, conjugations, to be able to fill, for example, this activity in. That is your foundation grammar gap fill. Uh, looking very quickly at the speaking. So we've got five English bullets now, not target language bullets, nor is the context in French, Spanish, German. It will be in English. There is no unknown question. And a key thing to bear in mind is there are no transactional role plays, such as buying things in a shop, going into a museum. In one way, it's a shame because it's highly relevant and meaningful. But AQA have made that decision because a lot of children do not go abroad or they are not in those type of formal situations, buying things and ordering things. So the role plays are about discussions, conversations between friends. The reading aloud is obviously a new text-based reading uh, activity. There are four set questions afterwards. The photo card, there are now two instead of one. And the opening phrase in the target language is tell me about the photos. There is no need to time and be worrying about messing about with a stopwatch. There is just a maximum nine minutes for foundation, 12 for higher. Now, clearly the conversation um, attracts most marks. So you do want to leave enough time for them to really be able to produce good language in the final section. So that's a quick look at the Foundation T at Roleplay. You can see it's in English. Uh, the Speaking too, we've mentioned the Reading Aloud. Um, that is an example of one. So you can see what it looks like. So students might want to do a bit of practice on how they annotate because they get 15 minutes preparation and they might want to, for example, cross out or underline silent letters, highlight key phonemes, et cetera. We've created a student-friendly marking activity there. And I won't go on to the independent learner. I'm just going to go back to the one I wanted to show you earlier. Uh, here we are. So um, in the reading, there will be some words that they haven't seen before, but, and they don't need to produce this language, but you can see there how I've taken an adjective or a verb and change it into a noun or an adjective. So something such as this could be very useful as a quick practice activity. And of course, it, it is, it's a good, good skill to be able to use. So that is in the reading and that's that derivation, derivational morphology we looked at at the beginning. Okay, I'm running out of time. I have 30 seconds left before I get switched off. Uh, so very quickly, think carefully about what you do with homework. We do a lot of speaking homework. We're looking now at a lot of verb drills. We're looking more at phonics activities. I can send you more details afterwards, but there is my email. Should you wish to get in touch with me, and I'm very happy uh, to share my PowerPoint. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we've got nine seconds left, I think, before it cuts, but I hope that was a, a useful, if not whistle-stop tour of some of the things we need to bear in mind. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.
please get in contact with me, email me, and I will promise to get back to you uh, in the next uh, couple of days. And remember, even if you're with Edexcel, a lot of the changes are, are uh, common to both specifications, but hopefully that will really help you to uh, consider maybe tweaking or even transforming part of your uh, Key Stage 3 curriculum. Thank you very much, everyone. I see emails are coming in already, that's great. And as I say, I will uh, share anything that I've presented today if it's of any use to you. <laughs>